Hi guys, Cordy Berlin here. So I wasn't planning to make a video like this today. Um, I've just been out with my friend, so um, hair's a bit messy, etc. Um, I've just seen this come up on Twitter, so I thought it would be worth talking about. Um, not in any great detail, because this is just a quick one. This is the latest uh, J.K. Rowling um, interview, and this is what she has said. Uh, when asked what she would say to people who claim she's become like the villains in her books, Rowling said, I would say that some of you have not understood the books. The Death Eaters claimed we have been made to live in secret and now is our time and any who stand in our way must be destroyed. If you disagree with us, you must die. They demonised and dehumanised those who were not like them. I am fighting what I see as a powerful, insidious, misogynistic movement that has gained huge purchase in the very influential areas of society. So I will make a proper video about this at some point, um, about transphobia in society, how it manifests, a lot of the misconceptions about trans people and actually how uh, transphobia has a lot of links to the far right, to anti-semitism, to like actual fascist ideas. You know, for example, something that happened in early Germany before the Nazis is there was this real pushback against people they thought were degenerates um, and the left and basically anyone who was outside of the gender binary. So they created a feeling of like suspicion around these people, like a, a sense of perversion around them as if they were dangerous, as if they were, you know, like indoctrinating children, coming for family values, basically turning them into these, these dangerous monsters instead of human beings who were just slightly outside of the binary and norms of the time. So this is something that we see regularly in far right things and it's so frustrating. I mean, there's so much wrong with this. When you think about Harry Potter, I mean, it's, I personally quite like the series because I grew up on it. I wouldn't support the stuff now because of what's gone on with JK Rowling, but it's not an in-depth look at fascism, right? It's a young adult series, which although it obviously has its, merit, its merits and I've enjoyed, it's not really getting into the real, uh, the real issues of fascism, right? How that builds. There's a lot of stuff in the books that it kind of skirts around, which is, is fine because it's about, okay, it's about like a teenage protagonist and maybe they're not, you know, it's not that kind of book. But there are a lot of things that it misses in the way it kind of builds fascism up. I mean, for example, if you look at Harry Potter, this is not me here to come for Harry Potter, but, you know, the very notion of, of for example, the house teams and Slytherin being the evil house, right? So all the bad ones come from Slytherin and you get <laughs> you get told if you're a Slytherin when you're young and most of the bad ones are there and, you know, having a characteristic based on a house team. And I know in the books it says, you know, sometimes we sort too early, but it is still quite a weird notion, you know. You know, even in, in the Harry Potter franchise, there's there's the idea that the staircases change if boys try to get into the girls' uh, rooms, etc. But then another weird thing about the Harry Potter books is that you know, I know other people have pointed this out, but a lot of the plotting and planning that goes on with our heroes takes place in the girls' bathroom, right? So it's guys uh, finding solace in the, the girls' bathroom, and that's how they kind of, like, take on the basilisk, etc. But it hasn't got, like, a firm grasp on fascism. It's very much, like, the bad guy's evil, he looks like a snake, <laughs> you know, he looks scary, he's the bad guy. You know, there are bad guys and there are good guys, and, for example, someone like Snape... Um, obviously that's a very complex character um, with good and bad elements in him, but it kind of does gloss over the fact that the man was a fascist and still bullies kids. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, he was brave though, so, you know, it's all fine. J.K. Rowling is not an expert on fascism and how fascism grows, and the, the Death Eaters in her book franchise are basically her version of, like, the Nazis, like, all the fascists, aren't they? Like, the Death Eaters. They are far right, they are... Uh, they basically attack people who, weirdly enough, they categorise people in terms of pure blood or half blood or mud blood. I don't know why I'm saying mud blood like that as if it's an actual slur. <laughs> it's in the universe. So they try and categorise people and people who fall outside of that are dangerous. Uh, people who express dissent are dangerous. They are essentially people that believe that, you know, you're born one thing and if you try and diverge from that in any way then you're not pure anymore, right? You're wrong. And and I, when I've planned for this, I probably will make a proper video about it. This is just off the top of my head. The way she is now connecting um, modern, modern day trans people or the movement for trans rights to Death Eaters is so, first of all, wrong because it doesn't even make sense in the context of the book. <laughs> like, it doesn't make sense. But it's also really, really disgusting because these are 
figures that are not sympathetic, right? They are like Nazis. They are the very people who are attacking trans people. It is the far right who attack trans people. It is often the right who are very uncomfortable with people kind of stepping outside of the boundary, of the binaries and the sort of people that will judge an entire group based on some misinformation or the worst case scenarios. So what you often have with TERFs um, or people who are transphobic is they will take an instance of a trans person that's done something awful, of which, you know, there are, of course, many because trans people are just a group of people like anyone else. So within a group of trans people, you're going to have every sort of personality on the spectrum, really, aren't you? And But they'll take that person and they'll say, right, that shows that, you know, trans people are dangerous, they're this, they're that... Um, and applying that to an entire group, even though the statistics don't back that up, because it's what we know from statistics, and I will get, I will do this properly, is that trans people are at more risk of being hurt than hurting somebody. You know, they are suffering, um, trans women are suffering, you know, misogyny, but also they're suffering transphobia on top of that. Like, it's it's very complex, and I don't think anyone could argue that, uh, you know, this this fantasy that trans women are living this amazing life... I wish they were living this amazing life, but, you know, they're having to contend with all these different stuff, this misinformation, this reframing of them as these sort of dangerous predator characters. We have a huge amount of hate crime going on. We're seeing trans people used as the latest kind of scapegoat distraction technique in our move towards the right here, you know, our moves towards fascism, because they need a sort of degenerate, degenerate group like in the past, to say, oh, look, they're destroying family values and wouldn't it be better if everyone was in the binary and, you know, in fact, we should be suspicious of people who are outside of the binary. Um, You know, they have, like, malicious intent. In Rowling's quote, she says, we have been made to live in secret and now is our time. But in the context of the Death Eaters, I, I, I I feel insane even talking about this, in the context of the Death Eaters, it's because they're fascists, right? So they've been shamed into silence, right? rightly so, because they're fascists, right? It would be like how Nazis, we would hope, <laughs> would be shamed into silence. People aren't going to be out and out obvious Nazis, although that's debatable. I mean, today, I said this in another video, but it's not necessarily Nazi or fascist policy that people have a problem with. It's the name of Nazi, or etc. you know, not the actual policy. But in that context, you know, they are living in secret because they are fascists, right? In the Harry Potter universe, they are, like, Nazis. They have committed these, like, mass murders. They are the fascists of that universe. That She's kind of comparing that to trans people, as if, oh, we've been made to live in secret. So kind of blaming them for their own having to mask to survive, like, being closeted, like, having to live in a different way to who you are because you live in a world which isn't broad-minded enough and there isn't enough education uh, for kids that, you know, it's all right to just be who you are and we don't have enough support in place or enough education. She's actually now using the fact that trans people have to be uh, closeted, for example, in some cases. I don't know if closeted is the right word, but um, have to kind of keep that stuff secret for their own safety. She's now making that seem like that in itself is insidious. And watch how they do this, because... I study a lot of Nazi propaganda and I've been doing that a lot recently for another topic which I'm kind of getting into in quite a big way Um, and that's what they do so they'll make it so that a group is monstered and they will make it so people in that group feel like they're in a hostile society so they might in some ways try to assimilate now some will, will be you know, be themselves and they'll push back and they'll be even more themselves and they'll in some ways will push further and then people will say to them oh you know you're narcissistic you want too much attention you're trying to be dramatic when really when you're coming at something from a situation of inequality you know no matter what you do you're going to lose because if you're someone who goes over the top I'll put in quotation marks to make a point because you're living in inequality and you want to make a point and you want to be vocal and you want to be seen you know that's seen as being too much and being dangerous but if you go the other way and you try and keep your head down and you try to assimilate they also make it so even then you're thought of as a danger because they turn that into something insidious so no matter what you do as a trans person by this logic you can't win right you're a danger no matter what happens you know, and they, they cover this and they say, oh, it's not trans people, I don't have a problem with trans people, I have a problem with trans activists, etc., which I have my own issues with because, you know, I often see people saying trans activists when isn't a trans activist somebody who uh, 
supports the rights of trans people. I'm not saying all activists are perfect because you're always going to have some people who do horrible things. But the very notion, it's like how Antifa, or Antifa, I don't know how that's pronounced, you know, has become this bad thing. When being anti-fascist is a good thing. <laughs> being anti-fascist is a really good thing to be. This comparison is implying that trans people have... It's like a blatant comparison, I can't believe I've seen it. That trans people are actually secretly hiding themselves and they've been waiting for their time. Their time to do what? To live authentically, right? To, to live in the way that they should live, right? To be themselves, to be open about that. Like, what's the threat here? And this is why I don't believe it when, you know, these transphobic people say I'm not transphobic because some of them will say, I just care about women's rights. If you cared about women's rights, and I, I feel like trans rights and women's rights are often overlapping because you have trans women, but you know, even if se even as separate things, they complement each other because I believe that we're all more free when we have less strict adherence to a gender binary and less policing based on gender roles. You know, I, I think to me, that's, that's how it makes sense in my mind. But for argument's sake, you know, a lot of them say, oh, you know, I, it's not that I don't like trans people, it's that I, don't think that they should be, you know, they it's ruining rights for women, etc. And it's misogynistic. And oh, you know, I don't think that uh, we don't want male people in these women's spaces. And it's not because of trans women. It's because cis men will take advantage of it. And this is why this kind of falls flat as an argument. And you know, it's just bigotry, because if you were arguing that for real, your sympathy would be with trans people, right? Because you'd say, look, I'm really sorry that predatory cisgender men are going to try and use this uh, this kind of, this law, to hurt people, you'd be in solidarity with them, right? You wouldn't be monstering them, because by that logic, trans people aren't the problem. And that's how you know that they're transphobic, and they've got a problem with trans people, because they always, they tend to always lean into this kind of idea of trans people as predators, right? As trans people as dangerous and dark, and trying to take something away from women, which doesn't make sense. So she goes on to say, any who stand in our way must be destroyed. And we see this again in far-right movements because they, they kind of assign too much power to minority groups trying to gain their rights. Trans people are not trying to destroy people. Trans people are trying to have their rights respected. Don't, don't fall into that, like that, that gaslighting. It is trans people who are being destroyed. It is trans people who are, they're attacked. They are forced into, you know, not, being able to be open about who they are, uh, in some ways hurting themselves. Trans people are, are hugely at risk of a vulnerable group, yet they're now being reframed as the big danger. Even though they're a minority, and even though we know that they're struggling a lot as a group, you know, they might seem harmless. You know, don't be fooled though, you know, don't start pitying them. This, it feels like far-right propaganda, you know, and there are parallels in the early Nazi propaganda. You know, there really are. You know, she talks about, you know, if you disagree with us, you must die. But what's the reality here? Because that's not what's happening, is it? You know, it's not... There are so many transphobic people, and I'm not seeing them... I, I'm, I feel like I'm going insane. That's not a thing. It is trans people who are dying. It is trans people who are suffering and dying and developing mental health issues and uh, not being accepted by people and feeling afraid, living under such immense trauma and stress, which will then um, have like a knock-on effect to your physical health as well, like the length of your life, all these different things. It is trans people that are being eradicated and denied. And then it's being twisted. And this is from the far right playbook. She says they demonized and dehumanized those who are not like them. Where are trans people dehumanizing cis people by asking for their rights? It, it's just not a thing that's happening. You know, it's like she is, she's conflating the criticism that she gets for what I believe is transphobia, but you know, you can argue that, with being demonized and dehumanized. There's a privilege that she has as a cisgender woman, a white cisgender woman of considerable wealth, to talk about dehumanisation and what that means to live with, with the platform that she has. And I don't deny that she's really struggled from misogyny and I know she's had a background of, she was in an abusive relationship, which is horrendous and she's gone through a lot. I do understand that. But to talk of this sort of dehumanisation and to do that from a position as a wealthy white woman who, who can talk about those things, it's just so wrong. It's so wrong to me. If there's people who know about being demonised and dehumanised, right now that's the trans community. And for what? 
She says, I'm fighting what I see as a powerful, insidious misogynistic movement that has gained huge purchase in very influential areas of society. This sounds like early Nazi propaganda. This is the sort of thing that they would say about, um, you know, gay people back then. Uh, you know, the, the left, the Weimar Republic, you know, the uh, the de degenerate Berlin. That The problem is the people are too, they're too vocal and too powerful, but they're also too small and secret and insidious at the same time. So they're hugely dangerous and, you know, a, a threat. But of course in society you won't see lots of them, but that's okay, they still exist as an evil. It's just that they're under the radar because they're, they're that sneaky and they're that evil that it's an insidious plot. You know, the idea that these people's existence is being presented as an insidious plot, you know, gained purchase in, a ver in very influential areas in society. Gained purchase, are, are trans people not part of society? Are trans people not our siblings in this society? Do they not make up society? You can't invade a society that you're part of, you know. We're all different. We all have different needs and ways that we present, and those are conversations that, that need to be had about how in a progressive and diverse world, the world that we want to live in, you know, how we make that work, all of us together. But what definitely will not help in any way is using this sort of rhetoric, uh, equating trans people to these all-powerful fascists who are also not very powerful and sneaky at the same time. This is what the Nazis did, right? This is what fascism does. They create a panic around people who are outside of a binary. And all they're actually doing is they are forcing that binary onto everyone, essentially. They're creating suspicion around anybody outside of that binary. It creates fear. And I just, I just thought it was a really awful thing to see. I'm just really worried about this framing and I will make a video in the future like with statistics and maybe even talking about quoting the propaganda and you know, how that was back then and in different fascist movements, you know, this will not stop with trans people. It will impact overall LGBT people, you know, and that's why it's so easy for cisgender straight women to say this, you know, and to do these things and not realising, or maybe they do realise, that it's actually going to make it harder for everybody. You know, it's, it's creating a climate of suspicion where if you don't fit the gender binary, if you do things in a slightly different way, then it's like you're a threat. I don't want to live in that world. There's better ways. There's so many better ways. Like, I'm not saying there aren't conversations that that need to be had about how we do better as a society to like respect each other and support each other but i can't see how we get there by demonizing a vulnerable minority group and i just find it really disturbing and people who say that jk rowling isn't transphobic i would say look at what she said here she is literally linking trans people to her in-universe fascists she's calling them insidious and powerful and dangerous and uh, accusing them of dehumanising groups. It's straight out of the far-right playbook, playbook, and that's where transphobia always leads, you know, or it can always be found on the far-right. Anyway, this was not planned, but I just wanted to read that out, and um, how depressing, how incredibly depressing. But um, thank you for listening, watching, and I'll see you really soon. Okay, love you. Bye.